Hi, I'm Ken Riley, pastor of Hewitt Community Church, and I want to thank you for taking the time to visit with us today. If you're inspired by what you see or by what you hear, or you'd like to know more about Hewitt Community Church, then please visit our website, hewittcc.org. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another installment of our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, there are two things in on my mind as, as we get started. Uh, first of all, if you've been listening to the news, then it sounds as if shelter in place is quickly coming to an end. And so uh, we are one day closer to the day when we can all be together again, and I'm still counting those days. However, in the meantime, it is imperative that God's word continue to go forth, and I appreciate you watching tonight. Uh, your doing so implies to me that you put a premium on God's Word, and so I appreciate the fact that you're tuning in. Um, we're going to begin uh, by uh, finishing up uh, Paul's letter to Titus. Uh, this is a Bible study. It's entitled Living the Good Life. It's, it's based on Paul's letter to Titus. Uh, tonight, we're going to be finishing up Titus chapter 1. Uh, but before we do, uh, if this was a normal Wednesday night Bible study, one of the things we'd be doing sort of as an effort to prepare ourselves for the word is we would pray. So would you join me in a word of prayer before we get started? Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the message of Christ and for the gospel of Christ. We acknowledge that it is through Christ that we have this audience with you tonight. We acknowledge it is not by virtue of our righteousness or our goodness or, or anything within us that merits this audience with you, uh, but it's been made possible through your Son. And so we pause to express our gratitude. Moreover, we are grateful for your Word and, and for your Holy Spirit that enhances your Word. Your word is life for us. It is living. It is always relevant. That's, that's why it says that it's like a sword, that it, it cuts and it, and it challenges us. And we desire to be challenged by your word tonight. And so I ask two things. First of all, I ask that you will anoint me, that I will be careful not to speak my words, but to speak yours. But moreover, I ask that you will open our hearts uh, that you will prepare us to receive your word much like well-tilled soil is prepared to receive the seed. In like manner, we want to receive your word, not just so we can say that we've heard it or that we've uh, been to a Bible study, but so that it might take root in our lives. And as we act upon it, it might produce fruit in us and also fruit for the benefit of your kingdom. And so we pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay, so as I said, tonight we're going to be finishing up Titus chapter 1. But before we get started, let's review some of our past material. Uh, Titus 1.5, let me start there. In Titus 1.5, Paul writes, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town. Just to review, Paul and Titus at some point had visited the island of Crete. While they were there, they had preached the gospel. Uh, some people had been saved, and a church had been planted. Nevertheless, it was necessary for Paul to leave Titus behind, so as is Titus 1.5 says, he could attend to what had been left unfinished. There were some things that needed to be finished in order for the church to be properly established. Well, what were the things that needed to be finished? Well, number one, he says things needed to be put in order. Now, what does that mean? Well, it meant that in order for the church to be finished, that is, in order for it to be properly equipped to disciple believers, the non-negotiables had to be established. Things like prayer, Bible study, fellowship, worship. Without these things, Christian development 
is virtually and literally impossible. And so that was one of the things that Titus had to do in order to finish up what was left unfinished with the church in Crete. The second thing that he had to do is that elders and leaders had to be appointed. In other words, uh, people had to be put in positions of authority to ensure that the non-negotiables were implemented and that they remained in place. Now, the reason that these two elements were fundamental to the finishing of the church was because there were those who wanted to pervert the gospel and they wanted to pervert the precepts of God's word. It's with that in mind that I'd like to continue reading. Let's go now to Titus 1, beginning with verse 10. Let's see how that Paul puts it. He says, For there are many rebellious people, full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Okay, so protecting and defending the integrity and the purity of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the precepts of God's word is, in essence, warfare. And one of the first lessons of warfare is this. Always know who your enemy is. Uh, from this passage, Paul gives us three characteristics of the enemies of the gospel. Number one, he says they are rebellious. Now, it just so happens the word rebellious here in Titus 1.10 can also be translated as out of control. And so the imagery that is being given to us in that word rebellious is that of a spoiled child who is throwing a temper tantrum because he is not getting his way. Well, in like manner, enemies of the gospel and enemies of God's word are those who have rejected it because it does not align with their, their agenda their point of view, or their way of doing things. That's what the word rebellious means in this context. Now, a second identification mark of the enemy of the gospel, Paul says, is that they are full of meaningless talk. Now, that expression meaningless talk can also be translated as empty talk. And so, as you might imagine, it conveys people who are talking but they're not saying anything. In other words, it's referring to people who love controversy or gossip or arguing or, or legalism or, or just simply taking things out of context. And once again, as before, they are doing these things so that, that they can align the gospel of Jesus Christ and the precepts of God's word with their own agenda. And then finally, a third characteristic of an enemy of the gospel, Paul says, is that they are full of deception. Now, the imagery here conveys people who are led by their own feelings and their emotions rather than following the truth of God's word. They are allowing their actions and their choices to be influenced by their own human perspective rather than God's word, and they are influencing others to do the same. Now, in Titus 1.10, Paul says that there are many such people in the church. However, the implication here is that they are still few when compared to the entire church body. And so the question is, well, how does one or two or even a handful of people managed to throw the entire church body into chaos. Uh, why isn't the church standing up to these people? Well, the answer is found there in Titus 1, 10, 11. He says it's because they're of the circumcision group. In other words, these enemies of the gospel are not militant 
torch-carrying atheists who are demanding that the church doors be closed. These are respectable, decent, proper, polite, mild-mannered, religious-looking people. From the outside, they look like anything but an enemy of the gospel. Nevertheless, Paul identifies them as an enemy of the gospel because they are teaching things they ought not teach. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that they are not necessarily refuting the gospel or refuting the precepts of God's word altogether. What it really means is they are attempting to tweak it or they are attempting uh, to modify it. Uh, they agree with the fundamentals of Christianity, and they agree with the fundamentals of Christian maturity. Nevertheless, they think some things need to be added. Some, some rules needed to be followed. This needed to be done. That needed to be done. This sacrifice needed to be offered. This ritual needed to be observed. This offering needed to be given. That article of clothing uh, needed to be worn. And the list went on and on and on. They may have been nice people. They may have been well-intentioned people. Even in some respects, reasonable people. Nevertheless, they still believed in holding to a bunch of rules. And in holding to those rules, Paul says that made them an enemy of the gospel. Why? Well, because the rules never changed anybody. Rules have never changed anybody. Only the gospel can do that. Now, at this point, you might be inclined to ask, well, pastor, are you saying that there are no rules? That for Christians that no rules need to be followed. Well, no, of course not. Of, of course there are some rules that, that need to be followed. Christianity is not about throwing off restraint. Um, it, it's not about living as you wish. Uh, but Paul's point here is, the rules do not save you. Neither do the rules change you. The rules do not mature you. They do not grow your faith. Well, why is that? Well, first of all, rules can produce a false sense of security. It's incorrect to assume that by, you know, checking off some, something on your religious to-do list that you are growing in Christ. Uh, that would be like saying, well, I, I pray every day, check that off the list, but I'm still cheating on my spouse. Or you might say, well, I, I listen to Christian music. Check that off the list. But I'm still stealing from my employer. Or you might say, well, I go to church every Sunday. You remember when we used to be able to go to church every Sunday? Well, you could say, well, I, I'm doing that. But nevertheless, check that off the list. I'm still being abusive to my neighbor. In this context, all you're doing is trading one standard of living for another but you're not really changing anything. And Christian maturity is about changing. Christian maturity is about transforming who you are into the image of Christ. And rules just don't do that. Now, a second reason that rules will never grow your faith is because rules, more often than not, focus on the minimum requirement. Back in, in Luke chapter 10, uh, that's where we find the story of uh, the Good Samaritan. A and you remember that story was prompted by a religious expert's question to Christ. He says, who is my neighbor? Now, moreover, the story goes that this religious expert, he wanted to justify himself. A and what that means for you and me is that this guy was looking for the boundaries. He was asking Christ to give him some very clear and distinct boundaries or parameters as, into, as to who was his neighbor 
and who was not his neighbor. Uh, you might say it like this. He was saying, I don't want to be the valedictorian of the class. I just want to graduate. I don't care anything about my GPA being all that high. I just want to pass the class. I just want to know what the boundaries are. Well, rule keeping is often nothing more than that. It's just a matter of establishing the boundaries. And our human nature is such, you've heard me talk about this before, that once given boundaries, we become almost automatically preoccupied with seeing how close we can actually get to the boundary without crossing over it. But that's not the way that Christian maturity works. Look how Paul describes Christian maturity or how Christian maturity does not work in Colossians 2, uh, 21 to 23. Let's look at this together. Uh, Paul writes, Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Now, what is Paul talking about here? Well, in this passage, you might say that Paul is painting for us a portrait of a rule keeper. And a rule keeper in this context is kind of like a fitness model or a swimsuit model. Uh, you're talking about somebody who does indeed have an impressive physique. From the outside, they look really good. Uh, moreover, uh, it's very evident that they put in the work. They've run the extra mile. They've done the extra rep. They have denied themselves the hamburgers and the french fries and the milkshake. No, nobody can deny that they have put in the work. But with that in mind, notice how Paul paints the portrait of an authentic disciple of Christ. Uh, this is in 1 Corinthians 9, 25. Look what he says here. He says, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Now, what is Paul saying here? Well, in a manner of speaking, he's comparing the fitness model with the athlete. And on the surface, it would appear that the athlete is doing just about everything that the fitness model is doing. You might say that in respect to the rules, they are almost, well, almost exactly doing the same thing. Okay, nevertheless, there is still one fundamental difference. The fitness model is doing it all for the sake of appearances. But the athlete is doing it to win the prize. The enemies of the gospel in Crete, they were like fitness models. They looked good on the outside. Nevertheless, Paul says this about them in Titus 1.11. He says they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not teach and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Now, that word gain uh, initially is implying monetary gain. However, gain can also imply things such as uh, recognition and status and, and admiration. The point being that enemies of the gospel or rule keepers are almost always focused upon themselves. The second thing that Paul says about enemies of the gospel, he says in Titus 1.13, he says they pay attention to Jewish myths or to the merely human command of those who reject the truth. In other words, their primary motivation is the admiration of, 
and the approval and the acceptance of others. Just like a fitness model. They are more interested in saying what is popular or what is easy as opposed to what is true. Again, why are they doing this? They are doing it all for the sake of self-promotion. And then finally, Paul says this about enemies of the gospel, and this is in Titus 1.15. He says, both their minds and their consciences are corrupted. And what this fundamentally means is that it's not enough for them to corrupt or defile or, or deceive themselves. They insist on corrupting and defiling and deceiving you. Now, now, why do they want to do this? Because the more people that they can influence to follow the rules or to follow their rules, then the more that they can convince themselves that they are spiritually or morally on the right track. Okay, so now that we've identified the characteristics of the enemies of the gospel and the precepts of God's word, now it's time that we examine ourselves. As I've said, authentic Christianity and authentic discipleship is not about throwing off the rules and living however you wish. God's word does impose rules and standards and boundaries which are necessary for our spiritual growth and our spiritual maturity. But the question for us is this, how do I follow the rules implementing them as they were meant to be? That is, how do I follow the rules using them as they were meant to be a tool for my Christian development, for my Christian maturity? Well, I think to answer that question, I need to take, I need to take you to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, beginning with verse 18. Let's look at this together. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? And then in verse 20, it goes on to say, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. Okay, so Paul here, teaching on defilement, says that defilement is not a matter of what's on the outside but rather it is a matter of what's on the inside. Now, for you and I uh, to, to really understand this, we, we need to take a subject from the Bible, uh, a subject which the Bible has a lot to say on. So just I just randomly chose this. Let's, let's talk about money for just a minute. You've heard me say before that throughout his earthly ministry, Christ, outside of the gospel, outside of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, Christ talked more about money than he did any other singular subject. Okay, so that tells us then that the, that the Bible has quite a lot to say about money. Uh, it has a lot to say about our attitude toward money and how we should handle money. Um, that said, there are some people who would try to convince you that money is corrupt. And so the very best thing that you can do is stay away from money as much as possible. However, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible implies that there is nothing whatsoever wrong with money. Nor does it say money will corrupt you. As a matter of fact, if you read the scriptures, it's really the other way around. Money doesn't corrupt you. You can corrupt money. Money, if you look at it in the scriptures, is actually a neutral. It can be made good or it can be made bad. It becomes good or it becomes bad only after it has been combined with your motivation. That's what Jesus was trying to say in Mark chapter 7. Money becomes good or it becomes bad once it comes into contact with what's inside of you. And life is full of neutrals. Um, solitaire. You know, just about every computer or laptop or cell phone or tablet today, uh, we have access to solitaire. Playing solitaire will not corrupt you. 
but you can corrupt solitaire. You can corrupt solitaire if you're playing solitaire when you're supposed to be on the clock working for your employer. You can corrupt solitaire uh, when you're uh, playing it at church, when you're supposed to be listening to your poor old pastor, he's preaching his heart out over a sermon that he slaved over all week long. I feel better now. Food. Food doesn't corrupt you, but you can corrupt food when you love it so much that you don't know when to stop eating it. Parties, social activities, having fun. Uh, contrary to, to what you might think, I, I do not feel that every single time God's people get together, uh, there's always got to be a Bible study or there's always got to be prayer. In my opinion, it's perfectly okay for God's people to get together, uh, to have a good time, to laugh, to have some good conversation, and never crack open the Bible once. That's because having a good time will not corrupt you. But you can corrupt a good time, whether the Bible is open or not, when you attempt to make the whole affair about yourself or about your agenda. Now, before I move off this subject, and just to be clear, there are some neutrals in life, but there are also some non-neutrals. Uh, take pornography, for example. Now, pornography is not a neutral. Uh, pornography is already corrupted, and it will corrupt you. That's because it misrepresents what God, had, God intended sex to be. Uh, these days, uh, you see and you hear a lot of advertisements aimed at, at sexual performance. Well, sex was never supposed to be about performance. Sex was supposed to be about intimacy. But pornography makes sex about performance. Pornography makes sex about what you can get out of it for yourself rather than using it to please the other person. That's why pornography is corrupt. And so the question then is this, what is the difference between living for the rules versus using the rules to live for God? That's an important question. Let me repeat that again. What is the difference between living for the rules versus using the rules to live for God? Well, there is one fundamental difference. The rules say you shouldn't do that, but the gospel says you need not do that. Let me give you an example. Um, in John chapter 4, it tells the story of a Samaritan woman. Jesus encounters her and um, you've probably read the story before, and uh, we find out through the story that she's had five husbands, and she's living uh, with her boyfriend, and, and that's the boyfriend that we know of. How many other men could there have been that are not mentioned? I, I don't know. Um, and if Christ had made an encounter with the woman all about the rules, then his conversation with her would have gone something like, he says, you need to stop doing that. You need to stop living that way. You need, to, you need to straighten up and you need to fly right and you need to do it right now. But that's not what Christ says to her. Look at what he says to her in John chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. He says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In other words, Christ somehow was able to see into this woman's heart. He was able to see inside of this woman and see that she was thirsty. She was thirsty for meaning and purpose and identity. And she had been using sexual intimacy to find it. But if you do the math, five husbands plus one partner, and again, those are the men that we know of, she had made sexual relationships her savior. Nevertheless, it had not delivered. It had not done anything to change her. It had not done anything to quench this thirst that is inside of her. The rule said to her, well, you shouldn't do that. Relationships with other men will never quench your thirst. But the gospel says you don't need to do that. You, you don't have to do that. 
You don't have to look to other men. You don't have to look to other relationships to quench your thirst. That's because Jesus Christ offers something that can quench your thirst and can quench your thirst for all times. Therefore, man-made rules will never produce true disciples. That's because only the gospel can do that. As I bring this Bible study to a close, I, I want to take you back to Titus chapter 1, beginning with verse 2, where Paul writes, The hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time, and which now at his appointed season he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. In other words, it is the preaching of the gospel. It is hearing the gospel, not the adherence of a bunch of rules which changes lives. Moreover, is it the gospel which molds us and matures us and points us in the direction of Christ. And so we are called to live the gospel, not a bunch of rules, so that we might not only be pointed in the direction of Christ, but that we can also point others. It is for this purpose that we are, are therefore committed to protecting and defending and preserving the gospel of Jesus Christ and the precepts of God's word. It is the only way, the only way that we will ever point ourselves or ever point others in toward this thirst or toward this, this water that can quench our thirst for all times. It is only the word of God. It is only the gospel. We can truly change who we are from the inside out. That's the reason why that is imperative, especially in these days that we are living in, where we are apart and, and not together, that individually that you are protecting and defending the integrity and the purity of the gospel, that you are in protecting and defending the sanctity of the gospel within the four walls of your home. It's because it's the only thing that'll change you. It's the only thing that'll change your marriage. It's the only thing that'll change your business. It's the only thing that'll change your finances. It's the only thing that'll change your relationship with your children. It's the only thing that will conform you into the image of Christ. And while these shelter-in-place days continue to linger on, it is just imperative that we hold on to this word. It is our only hope. And so there at home, I hope that in these days, even as we see these, these shelter-in-place days coming to an end, that you will still maintain holding on to the gospel, holding on to the promises of God's word, not just because it's good, not just because it gives you hope when nothing else does, but because it is the only thing that will ever truly transform you and change who you are from the inside out. God bless you. Thank you for watching today. I pray that you have been blessed from having heard God's word. You know, I, as much as I appreciate this technology, it still doesn't compare with being with you. I, I'm missing our Wednesday night talks where I invite you to, to, to join in and, and to give uh, your uh, opinions and your thoughts and your comments and your questions. I'm really missing those. And, and I'm hoping that as you're listening to these Bible studies, that maybe you're jotting down your questions and, and your thoughts and your comments. Maybe when we get together, we'll, we'll catch up and bring that all together. Ah, bottom line is I, I just miss you. I, I miss you so much. And I'm looking forward to being with you again. But in the meantime, stay strong, stay, uh, stay true to God's word, and we'll see you again very, very soon. Thanks again for watching. If you'd like more information about Hewitt Community Church, then visit our website at hewittcc.org. And if you'd like, you can give by clicking on the button in the upper right-hand corner. But most importantly, remember, if you've been blessed in any capacity from God's Word, then you are automatically obligated to be a blessing to those around you.